we look down into a mold and we see metal rising in a mold, and you watch it coming up, you can always see the oxide on the top. And the oxide layer, as it happens, it, it comes up in a rather special way. The oxide splits and moves to one side. And as it comes up, it reforms immediately and splits again, reforms. So it's continuously splitting so that that surface oxide becomes the skin of the casting. And so there's no oxide in the matrix of the casting. And that is a critical way to make good castings. And if only it were true of the normal way in which we make castings. Normally, nobody bothers to make castings this way. Metals are poured in from the top. And this creates a lot of turbulence and we're churning in that oxide surface. Now, here's our oxide surface. Here's liquid metal, here is air. And the problem with that, the oxide, is that it isn't a liquid normally. It's normally a solid, so it's a very thin solid. And there's no problem with it being on the surface, especially if it splits and moves to one side. But if we pour from above, this tends to happen. And so we study this for just one moment. The top side is dry in the atmosphere and normally quite rough on an atomic scale. Whereas the other side is in atomic contact with the liquid. So here you've got the matrix and any reactions which could happen like precipitates forming could form under here without any problem because of the perfect uh, link between the atoms. But if we now do this, and this goes off into the melt, we have a dry side to dry side contact with no bonding between these two. And so this is now a crack in the liquid. And with pouring turbulently, the metal just jumping and splashing and flashing as it goes into molds, we're creating a snowstorm of cracks inside the liquid. I mean, it's an extremely damaging thing to do. And this is what we're doing with our liquid metals. In virtually every facility I go around the world to see, this is what's happening. We're damaging our metals. And this shows the, can you all see the screen we've been standing in front? Okay, no problem, good. So here the surfaces coming together by impingement or by folding, but every time they come together, the fundamental way of entrainment of the surface is, is a dry side to dry side contact ensuing. So we all are making these double oxide films, which I call bifilms. And here it is happening in the aluminium industry. And it's not this chap's fault. This is the way the whole process has been designed, that we melt somewhere and we pour it into something else and we carry it and we pour it again. So the repeated pouring processes, every pour is a disaster for the quality of the metal. And it's not just in aluminium. This is it in steel. And here's the arc furnace just tilting. It's only a little arc furnace, about five tons. And they're pouring this five tons now into the ladle. And it, it, that pouring action, I mean, if you've never seen steel poured into a ladle, I recommend you see it because you'll never forget it. It is the most horrendous and frightening thing you ever saw. The metal is churning away on this great heavy liquid, pounding and thundering. And it's, it's the most frightening thing. And so here we are doing enormous damage to the material, which in the furnace was probably of excellent quality because any entrained oxides at that time have time to flow out and join the slag. So the steel had become very good. And then we tilt the furnace sideways and pour it into a ladle and wreck it. It couldn't be worse. And this is where all our 
metal manufacturers are their processes for bringing down the properties of metals. And here's a little example out of the uh, casting aluminium. Some of you will know this little test in the aluminium foundries all over the world. You take two little egg cups, pour the same metal into both, but one of them you put a, a bell jar over the top and pump down the pressure. So this is the same metal poured at the same time, exactly the same conditions, apart from the one on the left was done under atmospheric pressure, and this was done under a lower pressure. And if you take your if you take your biofilm with its rough surfaces and therefore its entrained air in amongst the roughness, you have a situation like this that explain first. Here our crack has gone in, but it doesn't remain this nice shape of an engineering crack because underneath there's lots of bulk turbulence in addition to the surface turbulence. These are two different brands of turbulence. The surface turbulence folds it in, but the bulk turbulence, so it finishes up quite small and compact, and normally I'll pass this round so we can all study the structure. It's a very interesting structure. Now you can see that it's still a crack. Uh, that's what you would like. Let me hang on to it, but you can look at it afterwards. You see, this is still a crack. It's nothing like an engineering crack. This is a crack which is very special for liquid metals and casting processes. So this is now a convoluted crack that's compact. And here I have this very special bit of scientific apparatus <clears throat> in which we have our convoluted crack, which is um, it's a double film with no bonding between these films. And if I now change the pressure between the outside and the inside, you okay, get like a miracle. It, it, you get like 10 times the area of the crack, and now it's like an engineering crack. And now the properties really fall, whereas when it's small, the properties are hardly affected. They still are affected because it's still a defect, but it's not too bad. So what happens now on the right with the lower pressure is that this now reopens Reinflates, fold by fold, takes some time, usually about two minutes, because each of these folds takes a bit of time to happen. And finally, finally, it gets back to being roughly an engineering crack with still bits of scallops. And you'll notice that here we've got these have the same right angle bends and uh, um, but because these are the same materials with the same defect density, just that the defect in one is compact, but the other, I call it unfurl, like a sailing ship unfurling its sails. And the properties on the right are a disaster. If you to take and machine a test bar out of it, if one of these was right across the center of the test bar, you have virtually no elongation. And this has happened, and, and we have pictures to show it. It's very, you don't refine the oxide completely over the surface, and the matching oxide is on the matching bit of fracture. So this is very common in practice. And what I'd like to propose, this is just a proposition at this stage, that all cracks and all failures of our metals, doesn't matter whether it's hydrogen embrittlement or fatigue, whatever kind of failure mechanism, every one of them starts from a bifilm. Every one. Now, that is a proposition, but I believe it to be true because when you look at, into 
how metals can fail, how a crystal lattice um, can develop a crack? The answer is no, it can't. There is no mechanism. It's interesting. I was shocked when I came to that conclusion. Let me give you one example. The, the mechanism which everybody quotes and which I learned when I was doing my metallurgy as a student was that one of the certain mechanisms to develop a crack was the, uh, the, 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 the barrier to dislocation. So the dislocation pile up and that if we kept piling dislocations up along a slip plane, we'd open up a crack and that would be the crack which caused failure. Huge amounts of research have been done on that. Not once has it ever been observed. This is both in simulation and in real time microscopy. It's never once, but even though dislocation pilots are common, are happening all the time in metals, they can't generate cracks. And it's simply because the bonds between atoms are extremely strong and you can't separate atoms. You can rattle dislocations through, but that's not separating atoms. That just they're doing leapfrogging across the back, across the uh, across the gaps. So, and if you go to look at all the other mechanisms which are proposed, um, like um, vacancy concentration and all this, sort of, uh, all these um, vacancy uh, precipitation and condensation, um, all these mechanisms have faults in them and have never actually been observed. So the metal in itself is stronger than we think and very resistant to failure. And if we think just for a moment, this is, this is the front of my book, I keep forgetting this. If we look at, say, a, a, a carbide crap, a carbide, in a grain boundary in a steel, very often there seem to be cracks. And our normal logic would tell us, okay, inclusions there, you apply a say, shear stress, and the shear test makes the crack. So we start with the inclusion, we have stress, and then the crack. One, two, three. That, in my view, is totally wrong. It's the other way around. The crack is there first. It's pre-existing. Okay. And the marvelous thing is, which probably none of us knew before, but I now have lots of evidence for, is that the inclusion forms on the crack. And then automatically has a crack through the middle now. So the bifilm is there and inclusions precipitate on it and stress is never involved. So all of the, con the conclusion we reach is that the carbides in grain boundaries don't actually precipitate on grain boundaries. They only precipitate on bifilms. And that's an energy requirement, interestingly. If you say, oh, of course they form on grain boundaries because of the energy saving of the grain boundary. Throw that out of the window because the energy saving is pathetically small. Whereas if you nucleate on a on a bifilm, which is nearly always a, a grain boundary, now there's huge energy savings on the strain. We save the strain energy of initiation of the of the uh, inclusion and the growth, because as the inclusion nucleates and grows, there's a shape change and, and a, a, a volume change, and those would normally put out a, a plastic zone around it, which would co cost it enormous energy, which normally it can't do in a perfect lattice. The energy is too high and won't allow the inclusion to precipitate. But on a bifilm, the Inclusion can grow partly into the bifilm and elastically open and pries open the bifilm as the inclusion grows into it. And it doesn't need its big plastic zone anymore. So it saves all that elastic, all that plastic energy, 
which gets rid of the strain by putting it into elastic opening of the bifilm. And we have evidence for this later. We'll get onto it. And here are bifilms onto which inclusions have formed and uh, this is uh, again an aluminium alloy. Um, I don't have equivalent pictures for steel, unfortunately. Um, but you're a steel department, got lots of steels. So we could, I'm sure you could find some exactly like that. Um, on the left, we've got alpha iron uh, precipitates, which have grown around the compact and biome simply because the alpha iron has a cubic lattice has such high symmetry, it can grow in any direction. So it goes all around this thing and holds it, fixes it in place so it can't open. And this is why the alpha iron is quite a good precipitate to have, as opposed to beta iron, this long thing here, which if that forms and starts to form on a, on a bifilm, and when the metal first comes into the mold, the bifilms are always like this because of the turbulence of filling. And now when we nucleate and grow an beta iron, which is a monoclinic lattice, it grows as a plane. And as it grows, it straightens. So now we have absolutely straight and um, beautifully um, opened up engineering cracks, which you see here which really bring down the properties. And this is why iron is such a bad impurity in aluminium alloys, because it permits the bifilms to open. In fact, drives the bifilms to open to bring down the properties. Whereas if we have manganese, we promote the alpha iron cubic lattice, which doesn't open them, grows around them and seals them. So now the properties remain fairly high. Still not very good because the bifilms are there anyway. So, <clears throat> so here we are with our steels. These are the fish eyes. Do any of you have seen fish eyes? I mean, they're, they're actually fairly common. Not to, and they're nearly all, always on all sorts of fracture surfaces. And our friend um, Murakami, in his wonderful book on the fatigue, um, is fascinated by fish eyes, which he talks about a lot, but he has no explanation for them. And my explanation is what I've already mentioned to you, that the inclusion forms, like a carbide forms on the bifilm and then opens it. So it prizes it open by growing into it to get rid of the, the the strain it needs in order to be able to grow but with fairly low energy. And so the thing opens like a discus it's, or, or like a bell tent as it works with a single prop in the center. And this, as the thing grows, the discus grows in uh, outwards. And so on both sides of a new fracture surface now, as fracture comes along, it goes through the center of the discus, finds the inclusion in the center, but carries on. And here we are with um, fish eyes in a, I don't know what steel this is, and it, because it's such an old piece of work, but they're such beautiful um, fish eyes. That I thought I, I like to show them, but there are plenty of other examples to be seen. Um, uh, these are some recent uh, research showing um, the, the, the very symmetrical features of fish eyes and um, the, the, this little region around here very often is, um, has a mirror smoothness and um, again all these things are difficult to explain unless you're opening a bifilm where you expect to see a mirror smoothness like that. And that's, you can often see that. And I uh, say so lots of people have done lots of research on uh, fish eyes, 
But as far as I know, what I've just told you is the only explanation which fits all of the facts. OK. <clears throat> That's a little, a little overview of some of the thinking behind my films and what they can do for us. What I'd like to talk to you about is, just for a moment, is the steel making and the steel casting process and why and how the bifilms arrive in the horrendous way which they do. And normally, if you want a special steel, and you're only wanting a few tons of it, and this is still pretty common in the industry, you can't have it continuously cast. Um, it's got to be ingot cast. So there's quite a lot of ingot casting still happens, only a few percent of the total, um, but it illustrates the problems that the, the steel making industry have, and I want to talk about it. This is the way you do it. Your ladle comes over, here's our ladle, and you open the stopper, and the metal pulls straight in, and this is churns around here, and it, it would not be a worse way of casting. But a high percentage of, especially if this was very special steel, which you really wanted for some very special reason, Firstly, it will be cast in the worst possible way to save money. Now, the steelmakers think they're doing us a favour by putting in a bottom pouring system. And this is at least as bad. Because what no one seems to worry about is that this conical basin here, which is used all over the world, in every kind of casting situation, that couldn't be worse. People are pouring into conical basins. What's the problem with that? Anybody know? Let me tell you. It works as a venturi accelerator or a venturi pump. So if the steam rushes in, it pulls in air and pulls in even more air than the steel. So what goes down that filling tube, there's more air goes down than steel is going down. And it's all churning together. I need to show you that. All right. Just before, I need to show you the solution. It's called contact pouring. So you don't leave this open here we connect straight up. So the system is sealed. We raise the stopper. No bubbles get into this flow. And the ingot you get is totally, totally different with completely different properties. This has fantastically good properties, particularly good elongation and good toughness. And whenever I go in the world now, the first thing I do when I walk into any kind of foundry or steel shop, I say, you must install contact pouring. And they give all sorts of reasons why they can't do it. I say, for God's sake, do it, because it's so important. Now, let me show you something else. Before we look at our video, just in case you don't believe me, I've got my simulated ingot here. Where it is. This is my empty ingot before I put my simulated steel into it. And I'm going to put into it one simulated lung full of liquid steel from John Campbell's lung. Let's see what quantity of liquid steel I might have in there. So here goes. This is a contact pourer. In this business of entraining the air and putting it down with the steel is a key thing, which this is a, a water model, which um, a dear 
crowd um, of uh, this foundry, Furnace and White in, in Sheffield. Um, uh, I've worked with them for many years and um, they got fed up with me talking about contact poor, which they didn't believe. And so they set up this water model there at their foundry and, and poured it themselves and took this video. So this is a video in which we'll see the conical basin and we'll see the, the liquid pouring straight down the centre and we'll see the entrainment of bubbles. So let's um, hold on, that's it. OK, we're now looking at the mould. Well, there are two entrances into the mould, which would bring in, a, say, liquid steel. This is a steel foundry. Right. Um, OK. Here we are. This is the conical basin. There's the, and so, and here's the mix. Now look at that. It's horrendous. What we haven't talked about is bubble damage. We haven't got time today to talk about these niceties. There's more air going through the system. And here it is bubbling up through the ingates. And every one of those bubbles is highly damaging. It leaves a trail of oxide behind it. <coughs> Jackal bubble trails. <coughs> so every bubble that's gone through leaves trails behind of a meter or two of, a, uh, of an oxide. And the oxide is formed on the surface of the bubble, slides off the surface of the bubble as it's renewed at the front as it goes and comes together dry side to dry side, of course, all the way back to where it was first entrained. So we have a huge long bifilm, which is probably meters long, and what's more, there are hundreds of them. So it could hardly be more damaging. So let's now look at, whoops, Where do I, here we go, thank you. Um, oh, there we go. <clears throat> Here's the same setup now, but with a contact pour arrangement. Now, right, it spends the first few seconds doing some damage, but now there are well, it's pretty well clear. And in fact, we can't see any movement of water because it's all perfect. There are no bubbles there. Yeah. Now, now the situation is losing pressure. Maybe some bubbles are arriving. Most of that water is on the outside. It's a leak. Um, right, and now you see bubbles coming through as it finishes. But something like 95 or 98 percent of the damage is reduced by this process. And it, as you see, it's a very simple process. Cost practically nothing to do. Whoops, there we go. Did you want to just, just have a look at the, the way it starts again? Because it creates bubbles for a second or so while it, it gets it gets going. There it, there it is. And now it suddenly becomes perfect. And now for the rest of the filling, it remains perfect. OK, and what I find I can do with knowing that there are bifilms there throughout steel, say, I, you can predict all the sorts of things like hydrogen and brittle mode, um, the arrival of blisters on 
Um, this happens to be an aluminium, but you get exactly the same things on steels. Um, stress corrosion cracking happens because the cracks are already there. And when you put a slight tensile stress on the whole system, the cracks get opened a little and it's easily penetrated by the corrosion. And so all these sorts of things, um, harsh embrittlement, slightly more complicated. And then <clears throat> again, we've got the, uh, the cracks pre-existing almost as a lattice throughout the, the metal. And now if we do a sensitizing heat treatment at which we precipitate certain carbides into our steels, then again, they precipitate out on the biofilms, prise open the biofilms, and so they start the process whereby biofilms are opened by internal pressure and the hydrogen diffuses in, especially on the biofilms and especially into these open areas in which the which are the fisheye areas, and these are there throughout the, uh, the steel. And all we're doing is pressurizing pre existing cracks. And all those fisheyes which were near to the surface, they, um, they blister first, which is obvious because the wall is rather weak. Uh, those in the center of the matrix uh, don't do that as they pressurize, they're effectively bringing down the strength of the material, certainly bringing down the elongation and um, toughness properties. <coughs> and, uh, excuse me, I've got a clock in my throat. Um, when I introduced the contact pouring to my Sheffield Steel Company, um, it was very interesting because they uh, have, they cast a, a lot of the super duplex stainless steels. And uh, they always had a percentage of failures of the steels for reasons they didn't know. When they, the toughness of the steel fell below uh, as a, a specification threshold of about uh, 40. 40 joules, and, uh, and they were getting failures because they were getting below 40 joules. And then I got them to change the filling system and put in contact pouring. This happened to be some years ago when the change of the filling system hadn't been fully developed. So they put in a kind of a halfway house of what I would now consider to be a good system. So at least they had contact pour. And immediately their toughnesses went up and they never now get below 100 joules when they're testing the, the, the Sharpie toughness. But what is interesting is that they were getting quite a big scatter now, way above 100. In fact, um, their Sharpie machine bounced and wouldn't break the, the, the Sharpies anymore. And they had to upgrade their Sharpie machine from a 300 limit up to 450 in order to be able to break their, their Sharpie ten, uh, specimens anymore. So and this simple act of putting in the contact pore and improving the running system was helpful. What makes me furious about this foundry, and I tell them every time I go to see them, I say, but why don't you put in a really good filling system and then really get some good toughness in your steels? Well, and the answer is, we've done it, and it's good enough. We don't want to do any more because we'd have to train all the staff again to make a new running system. And it, the, the first load of training was so difficult, we don't want to redo it. So they've got a half developed running system instead of a fully developed running system. And that's where they are, and they're not going to change. But they're already shifted their toughness results of their steels way, way beyond 
what they need and they just say we're not going to do anymore because we're already we're already fulfilling all our orders with our product we don't need to spend money or spend time and trouble training up our operators to make better systems so uh, it, it's very frustrating for me i'd love to know i, I think for instance, they would find their Sharpie um, test pieces wouldn't break again with the new machine, and they'd have to build an even bigger machine to break their Sharpies. Um, or maybe maybe the Sharpies would never break, and that, that is a possibility. They, would, they could bend, but never fracture, because they couldn't initiate a fracture. Now, there's a thought which I hadn't thought before, but I think is probably true. Bear, I hope you're not despairing of, of all these Irish names, you know. Mm -hmm. But I have plenty of questions, but in, 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 in defense of my position, I have to say to you, these are things I experience on the shop floor. This is a reality. This is what people are finding. And when Martin says to me, oh, yes, we're doing some developments on these skills, but the properties are fine, but the toughness is a little bit lower than we'd like. I said, it's no trouble. I'll get you some good toughness you know, tomorrow. I'm sure I could do it. I'm sure. You know? I, I mean, this is what I do every day when I walk into founders. The toughness goes up automatically. As soon as they change the way they fill the castings, and they don't generate turbulence and fold in by them. Now, there's lots more evidence. Um, let's have a look at the time. I'll just carry on for a little bit. I mean, um, yeah, we, we can abandon this at any moment, you know, if you wish. Um, yes, let me talk quickly about secondary refining processes. Um, and if we talk about vacuum casting, and now this is Martin with his vacuum casting bit of kit, which you had, um, which I said, God, a terrible bit of kit. Um, it's beautiful vacuum furnace, but it pours vertically into a mold. Disaster. You're going to get no properties. Terribly sorry, Martin isn't here. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, he's going. He's going to suffer then. He's going to. <laughs> okay. Well, so here's our standard vacuum system, of which you already have one, um, and as there's nothing wrong with it, apart from the casting process. Melting's wonderful. Melting in vacuum, you know, wonderful. But the pouring, and you say, well, you know, it's got to be all right. It's in vacuum. Well, in in furnaces, in vacuum furnaces in which melting takes place, you cannot get a good enough vacuum. And that's because the melt is surrounded by refractories, uh, which have huge areas of, of, of absorbed water vapor in particular, but the volatiles too. And so when it gets very hot, these things outgas. And so it, it's impossible to get a really good vacuum in a vacuum chamber in which you're melting. If you're not melting in a vacuum chamber, you can get wonderful vacuums. But as soon as you melt with the refractories around to keep the thing hot, it, it's, it's practically impossible. And I, I mean, I've never seen it done. Um, I think Rolls Royce are persuading themselves that they've done it recently, but I'm not sure. I, I congratulate them if they have. But anyway, in general, this is a real problem. And having made uh, a, a, an ingot in this way, this is then carried to an either electro slag process or a vacuum arc process in which the thing is now, if it's vacuum arc, it's put into a vacuum chamber, and you, we make a spark, we melt the end, and drop by drop, we build up an ingot, a vacuum arc 
refined or remelted ingot as we take up our top poured vacuum induction melted VIM electrode and melt it to make a VAR vacuum of remelted ingot. And I mean, these processes are, are so simple. Here's our electrode made by vertical pouring. So I'm worried that it's full of cracks, but we are melting it um, drop by drop to make an ingot. And these are the world's most expensive steels and nickel-based alloys and uh, titanium alloys. Um, and they're used for the, the supercritical applications uh, like discs uh, for turbines, shafts for turbines, um, all the critical parts of the helicopter drive train are all either vacuum arc remounted or electroswag remounted. And the preponderance is vacuum arc. And you would think with such a simple process, what could go wrong? Yeah, should make something perfect. Well, it would make something perfect if the electrode wasn't full of cracks. And that is a disaster for the process. And what happens now with the electrode full of cracks is that the current, as it comes down, now has to follow a path through the cracks somehow. So it's seeking out a conductive path, which won't be down the center. It'll be anywhere. And so what very often is goes way off to one side. And so while the arc is happening on one side, the other side is getting cold. And that's a this is where the disasters set in. Interestingly, um, I've got to, hmm, I've got this slide wrong. <laughs> there should have been a, 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 an electro slag on the other side. Yes, I apologize for this slide. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, I'm going to make out the case that in fact the vacuum arc remelted steel is dangerous steel, unfortunately. So here's our process. And what's happening now when the arc moves off center is that the, the liquid pool moves off center and this starts to go solid now. And it makes what we call a shelf. These things are observed in vacuum arc furnaces that the shelves build out here. And now as the liquid rises here with the droplets coming in and starts to flood over the solid shelf, it happens in this special way that the shelf is sitting there in this atmosphere and getting an oxide. And now we've got a, a, a liquid which now starts to roll over the shelf to, to progress. And it's laying down its oxide on this first oxide like a tank track as it moves forward. And so now we're generating a double oxide, a crack. And what's more, this is a huge crack. It could be over half of the, the ingot nearly. And we finish up with something like this. There's our, sh our shelf. There's the metal rolling over. But the other thing is, because this is all cracked here, that this piece has actually fallen out. There it is. It's fallen into the melt prematurely. So this is not refined or remelted now. And as it falls through the surface, it carries the surface oxide with it uh, as a kind of a, a wrapping. If what happened here is, here is our melt and the droplet or the, let's say this is now about to fall in, a solid piece. And as it falls in, it wraps up 
the oxide and carries the oxide in with it. So this has its own oxide all around it, goes in and gets a second oxide wrapped around it. So it's a bifilm now, all wrapped around. This is three dimensional crack now as a major defect in the anger. And these are the white spots. This is a famous feature of vacuum art ingots that they're sprinkled. When you cut through the center and, and do an etch, the, 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 the microstructure is sprinkled with white spots of different sizes. Now, this one fell in and fell into the liquid. But this one didn't. Came out of here, fell down, and has fallen on a shelf. So now it can sit here for two or three minutes while it gets a really thick oxide. And so finally, when the shelf melts, they, this comes over the top and envelops it all, and it all falls in. This very, very thick oxide creates what the industry calls a dirty white spot. It, it really is very, very damaging. And so we've got white spots. That will be a white spot. This will be a dirty white spot. And, uh, and we've got the, the, the rolling over here of the shelf leaving cracks and biofilms right the way through the system. I mean, the whole thing it is full of defects. What's more, when the art moves over here, the crown, which is this splatted region here, can melt at the bottom and that can fall in. That makes another big crown defect. It's, the material is full of major defects. And I knew that right back in the 1960s, when I first went to work in the steel industry, and we had a, a vacuum arc machine and an electro slag machine, both in our same lab, and we'd melt the same metal in the two of them. And the electro slag ingot, we'd have that out. This was a difficult alloy called wasp alloy, a nickel base alloy. No, yeah, so it's still used quite a lot. And the Electro slag ingot would go into the forge and would forge like butter. Beautiful. The vacuum mark ingot, we take that out, put that in the vault, would break, fracture the first stroke of the forge. That was back in the 1960s, and the situation hasn't changed. If you don't machine off the surface cracks, it cracks every time it goes in to the forge or for rolling. And what's more, these things are say may used for turbine discs for for, um, for aircraft. And there had been since vacuum arc started back in those 1950s and 60s, there have been 600 failures of turbines as a result only of the disc failing. This is not counting shafts and turbine blades or anything else, but only of the discs exploding under the centrifugal forces and, and which are found when they look, they're covered in the oxides from the casting process. So here we have a process which could not be more misunderstood nor misapplied. And um, it makes me feel ashamed as a metallurgist to think that here we are manufacturing goods which should have been shut down half a century ago, and we're still making them. In fact, when I go to say to people, and I, I talk to people making these things to manufacturers, and Say, look, you know, these things are dangerous. We, we shouldn't be doing it. Oh, but we're making too much money, which they are. They're making a lot of money. So I, I see 
you know, the situation could not be worse. And the, the, the various historical failures, um, I mean, this back in 1989, um, this United Airways Flight 232, um, this is a famous one. And this was a titanium disc and um, had a hard alpha defect, but the hard alpha defect would have been stabilized by the oxygen. And um, uh, it's a famous crash because when the when the disc exploded, it cut the hydraulic lines, and it's all right. To, but this there were three lines. Uh, there was the primary line, then there was the one for safety in the case of primary broke, and then there's the one additional safety one. All three were severed when the disc exploded and so all control of the aircraft was lost and apparently could only turn right and uh, but managed to get onto the ground in one piece it came in badly though at twice the normal landing speed because they couldn't control it and half the passengers were killed but half of them were saved um, it was like a miracle of really good piloting and uh, this was the disc that uh, was found in a cornfield some miles away uh, after about they looked for it about three months i think <laughs> and then there was another one there was uh, in 2016 american airlines uh, 383 and this was it after they stopped on the runway and the, the, the disc blew up on the runway and they managed to stop the plane it never took off and all the passengers got out safely um but the plane was wrecked. I mean, it was, uh, so um, that was a lucky one. But what I see in at least about, not at least, but about half a dozen helicopter failures, which I've studied, where the helicopters have fallen out of the sky because of failure of the, their main, main drive shafts. And when you look, I've only been able to access the the accident reports. People won't allow me in to the accident investigation committees. Um, that's because I'm such an unpopular chap. Um, but anyway, the accident reports, it's quite clear that there's a tiny edge pit in this shot, tiny edge pit almost too small to see with virtually with my batteries. But from the edge pit, there are cracks. And so the natural um, interpretation is, well, OK, there's been corrosion. You have an edge pit, therefore it's a stress razor, and that has caused fatigue cracks to move out. And for those fatigue cracks to eventually cause total failure, and the downing of the aircraft. Well, sorry, but I think that's completely wrong. The real explanation, in my view, is that the cracks were there first. See? They're always pre-existing. This is vacuum arc steel. Don't forget, nearly every time vacuum arc steel. There's one supplier in Europe that I know of that uses electro slag material, which is perfectly okay. But vacuum arc, it's got these terrible cracks in it and they're there first. And now if you've got a slight bit of corrosion around, of course the corroder is going to get into the cracks and of course it's going to open the entrance to make an edge pit. Now, if I go back to their explanation, an edge pit will make no difference to a shaft this big driving the rotor when the shaft has been designed with a safety factor of five it's five times bigger than it need to be whereas if it were good steel you could make it to exactly the size that was needed with a, a safety factor of one and it would have performed but now we made it five times bigger so there's no way a microscopic dent in the surface from an HP is going to 
bring down the aircraft. It's not possible. The shaft doesn't even know it's got an edge pit on it. Okay, so you see there are real problems with real tragic failures and as metallurgists it's our fault. We're putting the wrong steels out there and somehow we have to get the message across that we need to make our steels better. Um, yeah. We need to finish some Shall I? Discussion and everything. Yes. 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 I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. To say about this, but in every case, one starts with a furnace, which in general you tip and you tip out into a ladle, and so all of the steel making, casting processes downstream from that all suffer on that first act of pouring into the ladle, of which the drop is like at least two or three meters. So oh, go on, yes, yes, do it because, again. Because in steelmaking, you'll use uh, deoxidation, then you'll use armor bubbling to get everything to do, so it flows out. What, is this in the furnace, or now are we talking now in ladle? In the ladle, in the ladle metallurgy, you'll use armor bubbling, and flow and yeah. um, quite an even, um, Vacuum and um, vacuum top to float out. And so, the yes. one, thing, one thing that's nice with steels is yes. that a lot of well, oxide will float out, and then you move to things like uh, slag layers yes. um, and then submerged entry nozzles. So, yes. I don't think for commodity steel production yeah. on continuous casting, it's not bad. You know, it really isn't. I certainly accept your point on some of the other one, the aluminium in particular, but um, I think commodity steel processing is pretty good. But you, what you're describing is ladle metallurgy now, isn't yes. it? Yes. But you've got to get it yeah, out of the melting issue. furnace into the ladle. Yeah, then you can see, see you do, um, and a lot of that in ladle metallurgy, you will then get rid of all the. Uh, well, no, be careful. Be careful. You, you're certainly you're reducing them. True. Yes, we're going to get rid of everything. That's right. Except that. Yes. Um, yes. Well, I mean, I, and on all these processes for reducing are only there because we've actually just put them in five minutes before when we've emptied the furnace into the ladle, and then we do our ladle metallurgy with our argon bubbling and vacuum or whatever we wish to apply. And it makes a difference to how you cast it because everything that you can get rid of, you will get rid of. Um, you can't, there's not much else you can do to get rid of stuff in silver. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have you know, hours worth of label metallurgy processing before you get it to the caster. And then right. the caster, you have a tongue dish and yeah. you continuously keep the tongue dish filled so you're not totally pouring into a tongue dish. No. The there on top, and then there's some okay. entry yeah, let me let me just yeah. talk about you take your you do your ladle metallurgy. So we do the best we can to raise the quality to the best quality we can, which is still of a limited quality in my view. Okay. Tell tell me how to improve further. How, how would you improve this oh. in the label before you even get to the caster? Well, wait a minute. Okay. Hear me out. Okay. You take the ladle, which is at this moment as good as we can get it, and it goes up and it sits on top of the casting machine. Now, I have worked on a continuous caster. So I do know what I'm talking about. The stopper's open and it falls into a, a launder. Now, that falling process is quite damaging. Now, having said that, there's only a limited amount you can do. To, to reduce the damage, but the, it's not done well. And then there's an, the, the SEM, the submerged entry nozzle, which goes into the mold from the end of the launder. <clears throat> I've never seen one designed correctly. They had uniform tubes with some kind of holes at the bottom designed in different ways to spread the liquid around, depending on whether you're making slabs or ingots or rounds or whatever. 
But the fact it's a uniform tube, I think, for God's sake, metal flows under gravity and it accelerates. You can't possibly use a, a, a uniform tube and hope to get away with it. And sure enough, you know, you've even got argon added at that point. All these dreadful things are happening which need not happen. And the SDN could be designed to be tapered to follow the tapering of the stream. In fact, I would over taper it just slightly, which is what I do with my castings on the shop floor when I'm making uh, shaped castings. And what's more, then you get zero entrainment of air. Whereas at the moment, the SEM is entraining, well, there's argon put in at the top in the hope to make sure that argon goes into the metal. But the argon itself is at nearly always entrains the surrounding air as well. So it takes air in with it. So we are necessarily damaging our metal at all sorts of points through the system, which need not happen. This is why you need some good people to get out there and say, let's sort out these little problems and get some good steel for a change. So got all your chaps around here. They, you know, they've got a job. And I wish them luck, you know. No shortage of problems to sort out. Oops. Yeah, this is the, uh, this, even this isn't wonderful. Um, but what we have <clears throat> after, um, after being um, loaded with um, hydrogen, and the properties are falling, we've got hydrogen and brittle on this side. This is before hydrogen, this is after. This is our friend Emilio, who you will know. And, um, and how do you explain um, these, these boundaries and this, what would appear to be um, the cleavage? Um, and how do you explain um, these, these boundaries and this, what would appear to be um, both cleavage surfaces. It's going to around the failure, isn't it? So it is, it is hydrogen and red I don't know because I don't know much about that area, but I can imagine that it's hydrogen going to grow boundaries and we've got an intergranular failure mechanism. That's an intergranular failure mechanism. Uh, I think the yes. rationale for what's causing it all, that's not something that I can think about. Well, yeah. it would be very unlikely for a grain boundary to fail because. Once again, you've got atom to atom perfection. No, we do. We get I so don't so know. you get intergranular failure and you have sulfur. I don't think you have to get intergranular failure. We all live with all our lives. Yes. And the boundary does appear to fail. But I'm saying this is only the appearance. In fact, there is a bifilm there, and the bifilm comes apart because that's what I do. The boundary fails. I don't disagree with you. When you've got the PAGs, prior Austin green boundaries, which are very stable in, throughout all the, the subsequent crystallographic uh, um, transformations that happen, but the boundaries and the PAGs stay in place, and things continue to happen on PAGs all the way down. I'm sure it's because the PAGs are there on bifurcations. And the bifilms are there and they're causing precipitates and they're stable in the structure. So, if you go to a delta ferrite, austenite, alpha ferrite transformation, you then got to go back to whether the, the bifilms would be there in the delta ferrite. If you've got trans yeah. if you've got reconstructed transformations of austenite um, to alpha ferrite, you don't tend to see such a carryover of the pyrosphere. You do with marble site veins, but less so the reconstruction transformation. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, is anybody else got any? I was going to say, but I'll keep going. Yeah, yeah cool. I listened very carefully, and, and there's a lot of sound. Sorry, I listened very carefully, and I think there's a lot of sound in this in your argument. And if you're talking about the solidification of liquid metals, then yes, everything you've described has the potential to happen. 
a lot of what Claire's been talking about is solid state transformation. And, and the grain, I'm sorry, the, the biofilm is present, is trapped within the solid anyway. Hmm. But, but the, the one thing that I've thought about, if you go back to turbine blades and you convert the material to a single crystal, hmm. have you tried looking at some of this material that you think is contaminated with the biofilms after it's been converted into a single crystal? Because in effect, the single crystal conversion should allow the elimination of the biofilm as the molten front is pushed down through the system. The thing that brings to my mind, and I'm sorry, to my mind, you know, so we're really worried about containing hydrogen as a gas so we can go to hydrogen fuels. Mm. If we made our tanks that we want to keep the hydrogen in into single crystal items, we would have eliminated the problems you're dealing with. You've, you've jumped ahead too far. Sorry. Um, let's look at the problems. What happens in, when you're taking your, your echo based superalloy? And if you just allow it to solidify as a polycrystal, because it's been poured rather badly, and because it's from it made from material which was oxidized on its surface, there's a history of, of biofilms coming through the processing of the material, which arise in the the furnace where you're melting the metal for its final pour into the market. And um, so if now we just do an ordinary pour into an ordinary mold and let it go solid as a polycrystal, the biofilms are there swimming around and the grains are nucleating here and there and growing and they push the biofilms. They can't grow through them because there's the air there. Back in there between the two. So the biofilms are pushed by dendrites and by growth. And so they automatically, as grains grow, they appear at the grain boundaries. And now the grain boundaries are weak. They're all pre cracked very grain boundaries in the polycrystal. And so when you make a polycrystalline turbine layer, the, the, the Green properties and fatigue properties are very low. Now, we put it now, when we poured it, it's still got biofilms swimming around. But now, if we solidify and temperature grade it and grow the, 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 the solid vertically upwards slowly, we push biofilms. And in the main, they may be pushed up and out of the system. So the reason the single crystal is so good is its absence of biofilms, which are the weakening features. And you know, that's the only reason. For instance, had we have got liquid metal into the mold without biofilms, like casting nicely, for instance, we could have had polycrystals, which would have been as strong as the single crystal, in my view. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that grain boundaries are immensely strong. You can't open them, you know, in, in a fracture process or something. It's not possible. They're enormously, they've almost got the strength of this, the, the matrix. They're about the weakest that I've come across is about 80% of the strength of the matrix. So, they, and the strength of the matrix is huge. But none of these things would come apart unless we could apply them there, and then it comes back. So when you talk about you want your steel to contain hydrogen, the pressure bus, now we're talking, and I would say now, let's cast it well without bifurms, and I guarantee it'll be better than a steel full of bifurms, on which there's a real risk of hydrogen getting in, opening bifurms, uh, you know, and appearing to have embrittled the steel. In fact, it does embrittle it and, and sits there at grey bound, just opens grey bound, which is why it takes on that forward. Because the grey boundaries are the sites of the bifurcation. And even in the solid state, when the grains are recrystallizing and we've got movement of the, the grey boundaries 
again, every time they come up to a bifold, they stop. So automatically, those boundaries get a bifold in them. That's, it, that's not to say that there are some bifolds not in brain boundaries, they're trans -manual. And again, the, the way the casting is solidified, whether the grains grow in or whether the grains are equally apt, one gives you trans and the other gives you intergranular. So, uh, so, for instance, if you then were to forge this or roll it and you take the material out of the center of the material out of the edges, they have two different populations of bifolds, which will give you two different kinds of fractures. The plunderance are different. And there's still a lot there, which, which we have yet to tease out and I'll properly understand. I mean, I don't see how you could get a structure like that by grain boundaries failing, because without I can't see grain boundaries failing. I can see bifolds failing easily. And that's what I would expect. So all our pseudo um, cleavage fractures, which are apparent brittle fractures, Nearly every case, if not, if not every case, I would say these are bifold changes and due to the casting. These days, I think we can solve that question by using Aspen Pro. I think we can solve that question by using Aspen Pro. No, no, Aspen Pro you can see. We have a lot of time for studying some very incorporated in law of nano precipitates. They haven't anywhere else mentioned about bifolds or the reason for the nucleation of these. Yeah, but you could, you could, you could investigate whether they are there, because mm. you know, the problem with conventional techniques is that even though so there's a good case of oxygen without it anyway, because you can't disprove whether oxygen is there or not, well, um, or it's not sensitive enough. But using things like anti and no, that's why I'm saying a lot of like if you see yeah. they're grabbing dog, right? They 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 they, they, they do that and prove or uh, mm. the paper they right. But most of the precipitate studies, even in nano precipitates. Not a single time I have seen anywhere where there is there is a biping uh, probed by the atom probe, either in other minimal bias or in steel or hydrogen or nitrogen. I have looked at it. I have been having to see anything. I would need to be careful with the steels we choose. For instance, if you chose boron steels, I predict this won't happen, and it's because boron gives you the low melting point borates on the on the surface. So now when you fold over the surface, it's liquid oxide to liquid oxide. Folds up into little droplets, floats out gone. So bifolds is not a problem with most boron steels. And it's not to say that some people can't make boron steels and still get bifolds in them because they cast them so badly. But in general, it's possible to reduce the bifold content by liquefying the surface layer, which is a very valuable technique. And it does happen in certain steels, especially like boron steels. So, you know, don't choose a boron steel and then hope to look for bifolds because they won't be there. Um, but um, other steels, for instance, when they take nickel based super alloys, and I, I did get the chance of having a good SCM on the surface of a fracture. I couldn't find any metal. It's all oxide, all over the surface. I mean, and what's more, it wasn't oxide that had grown after the fracture. I mean, this is folded and double folded, rocked up. It's clearly a bifold and clearly formed on the liquid. I, I think you know, you're kind of actually right. There are lots of systems where I don't disagree with you. Yeah. I, there's a lot of systems where I, I think what you're saying yeah. is so much in that. There's a lot of evidence for it. Well, I think I'm just struggling a little bit with most of the students. But it challenges, I mean, that's why, this is why I hope that everybody enjoys the conversation because this is part of what we should do, is be challenged. And, you know, challenging us to think about it is, is absolutely the right thing because we'll go away and think about it's not, you know, what, why, how. Um, and that's good. 
But the other thing you need to take into account is actually what has happened to the molten metal after you put it through a good quality running system. I take you back to the, the camshafts you looked at through the X ray machine many years ago for uh, mm -hmm. Brighton. We, we in Brighton really struggled to keep a full runner system so there wasn't turbulence in it. And we believed, to you proved otherwise, that when it got to the entrance of the circular camshaft, it just flooded in and filled up nicely. What you demonstrated was they actually shot all the way down the camshaft and bounced back again. Mm. So you nice. really got to be careful in terms of how you fill. You'd be right in terms of the runner system, but then how it goes into the casting itself mm. makes a big difference. Well, I understand. Absolutely. That's why I think it's so good because there, there are times where the relative effects and the relative importance of different things become important. It's only if we're constantly debating it, then for a given application, production method, process, subsequent process of chemistry, that you can take all of these things into account and work out where the areas to tackle are, because it'll be different for different applications and different products. And, and so that's why this is so important. Is to force us to think through process and say what is control, what is the most important thing, control of products. Like every every fatigue um, failure I've looked at, every one of them can be certainly attributed to a rifle. Certainly. Uh, you know, and we have a, no, we have a question from okay. our uh, Yeah, that's Prasad. Can you ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Yeah, and, uh, can you ask a question? Yes, yes. Am I audible? Yeah. Oh, where is the uh, speakers? Uh... No, no, try the, 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 the mouse. Yeah, I see. Uh, hi, John. It's a, a very nice. I think the question is, uh, this one, bi biofilms are mainly caused by the turbulence in the liquid metal. What precautions do you suggest for HPDC mm. casting process, which involve deliberate steering of the molten metal? Oh, for high pressure die casting? Yeah. I, I don't recommend. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it's not possible to, to prevent the Phytons uh, forming in the um, You're hurting the metal in at you know, some huge velocity. It's got immense energy. It's just going to splash and jump, um, which is why I've never bothered to, to look into pressure die casting. However, now that we're getting super hyper sizes, whole whole bodies all at once, there might be. A chance now to to fill not at stupidly high velocities anymore, and that you we actually fill these things without folding over the surface, and, and then you would win. You would keep the good quality you originally started with. I can, yeah. um, no, I just wanted to make a comment on the discussion about the atom front. I don't recommend atom pro for these kind of measurements oh, yeah. because the electric field will break the needles. So yeah. if you have these kind of biofilms, <coughs> um, if you detect your, your, your charges, um, these usually break. So these are the failed needles. Quite often. It, yeah, the whole business of pressure die casting is complicated in my view. And the, 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 its properties, especially in long sections and thin sections, are the properties of the material which now contains the, the biofilms align in the structure. And now you've got a very interesting material, rather like wood, and it's got a fiber direction to the strength and its failure properties. Uh, and that's sometimes a benefit. So, as I say, it's, it's a complicated scenario, frankly. Um, uh, I, and I tend to keep away from it. It's too complicated for me. Yeah. Any, I'm going to any questions from the students? Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, please. Can I just say, yeah, yeah. I'm really sorry, John. I've got, got to go for the no, meeting. You're busy. Really appreciate it, John. Okay, well, as always, yeah, well, yes, I was excited you could come. Thank you. Yeah, thank you ever so much. I'm really sorry. Carry on with the Yeah, please. Yeah, let's carry on. It's not possible. Or, or how are you doing? Tell me again. Yes. I can't come around here. For aluminium, yes. that casting, yep. a low pressure that casting is feeding from underneath. Oh, no, no. Which no pressure. No pressure. So from your experience, will this just make that casting process one of the best for as to the strengths? Low pressure die casting is in principle a good way to fill the mold upwards because you get this filling by this special mechanism where the the, the, the surface film becomes the skin of the casting. So all the way it goes up in, into the shape casting, this is happening. The, the surface film is always forming the skin of the casting, which is a lovely way to make the casting. So you don't have a bifilm problem. So you can make beautiful castings. But every bi, every low pressure machine I see is filled by tipping the liquid in and it pours in and it churns as it goes, and the property, the, 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 the quality of the metal you use is awful. Is that possible, so for example, in pressurized uh, furnace, that you make yes. that material in yes. that, that, yes. that container and then pressurized, is that going to be the best of it? Ah. If, yes, uh, there are people who pressurize the mold to get a counter pressure uh, and you know the, the Hungarians have produced this counter pressure process where everything comes out under a hugely increased pressure, several atmospheres. It's quite dangerous, I think. You know, you've got a big pressure vessel around your casting machine, you hope it doesn't explode. But it, I, that's the wrong way to go, in my view. And I have a project up in the north of England now whereby we're treating our metal to completely eliminate bifilms. It comes into a pump now, which um, is specially designed to fill it in a way which doesn't produce bifilms. And then we're going to pressurize the pump to deliver the metal uphill into the mold, again, to avoid reintroducing bifilms. And this will be the first time in the world that castings have been made specifically to avoid putting bifilms in. And what we're hoping to get are properties which the world would have never seen before. Um, you know, like um, elongations, which we should, we're hoping for at least 30 or 40 percent elongation, whereas at the moment alloys normally have two or three percent, for instance. Um, but maybe we'll get 100 percent elongation, which would be wonderful. We, so um, um, the liquid metal is going to be put in our casting machine. Um, I don't think it's going to happen today. Um, it's going to happen by the end of this month, I think. Um, yes. So watch this space. I, I think we're about to make history. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Oh, right. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no more further questions. I once again thank Professor John Henry.